What's the matter with that? Um, I was just changing my incontinence pad. <laughs> okay, Graham, we love. Let's just check on Facebook. Hi guys, um, if anybody can hear us, um, <laughs> please let us know. Is there anybody there? Is there anybody there? Give me a second. I'm just going to tell you on the Facebook post. I've got, I've got it up on the iPad now. I've gone the other way around. It's up. Okay, I've tagged you, so it should appear on your page. <sighs> Nicholas, Eleona, Josh, they're all watching. It's your time to shine, G-Man. Oh, my God. Let me just see if I can get the full screen. How's it? We'll just, we'll just wait a little bit for people to join, Graham. Okay. There's about 20 odd people watching. Hi, Pam. The Jason is watching. Jean or Jean is watching. Victoria Martin. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Let's see. I think that one's best. I can just imagine the kind of questions that are going to come there. <laughs> so, guys, remember this is an interactive experience, mm -hmm. free of charge. So, anything you want to know from Graham, now's the time. Oh yeah. <laughs> I hope you got some space in your living room there in case you need to demonstrate something. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, can you read the comments? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, good. So maybe on your iPad, have your Facebook up so you can read. There's Lauren, she says hi. Fabio. Graham, can you read the comments? Yeah, you want to turn the volume down on that, Graham? Right? Are we good to go? Um, so welcome everybody. Um, just waited a couple of minutes for everybody to tune in. It's the much anticipated getting gritty with Graham. So anything you ever wanted to know about the Oswicologist, now is your chance. Um, if anybody has any anonymous questions, feel free to uh, message me and I will put them to Graham, no problem. Um, I will protect your identity. Um, hey Fabio, um, on a personal note, um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, one of the reasons I'm doing this little series, it was very um, spontaneous, honestly, um, was to gain an insight into these, you know, great people in our industry. So, um, you know, I think that all of them have some type of legacy and uh, something to give and have, you know, achieved many things or teach us many things in their time. So I think it's important especially for the younger dancers, but even for us, you know, to know a little bit more about them and, you know, their humble beginnings and what makes them tick and what they've achieved and what they like to eat for breakfast and what the flavor color is and whatnot. Um, and to basically humanize them and show the normal side. So that's my intention with this. And um, uh, I hope Lorraine is watching. I just wanted to um, say live um, that um, there was a little misunderstanding and, um, I apologize for any disrespect uh, or anything that was shown. Um, obviously, the great uh, Laird and Lorraine are a huge legacy that can never, ever um, be forgotten or the gravity of what they did, um, you know, cannot be taken for granted. So um, I'm glad that we, uh, that we understand that and uh, everybody is good. So the show must go on. And um, it's Mr. Graham Oswick in the hot seat. Welcome, Graham. Hello. Everybody that's uh, watching. The only reason I'm here is because you couldn't get anybody famous today. So anyway. Hey, mum's watching, Graham. Martin says mum's watching. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. 
Oh dear God. Now, <laughs> now I can't lie. So Graham, tell us what your current situation is. How have you been affected by the corona? Where, where are you? What have you been doing? What's your situation? Uh, well, I'm at home like everybody else, I guess. You know, my highlight of the week is going to Waitrose. Uh, always very disappointed if there's no queue because then that shortens my day out although we have been allowed for lenience now but yes I did complain to the manager the other day because the queue was too short and I cut down my people watching time uh, but yeah at home I feel like I've kind of got into a, a pattern of the way things are now and now I kind of wonder how I did the 12 lessons in between everything I am doing now uh, but really good at cleaning if you know things get bad so I can hire myself out as a cleaner um, painting's not so up to it yet, but yeah, okay, it's coming. But yeah, I guess I'm doing what everybody else around the world is doing, just trying to find things to find. Garden looks great. Garden looks really great. Have you been uh, teaching any online lessons? I've done a, I've done a few lectures, a couple of interviews similar to this, and a couple of uh, online lessons. But I have to say, I find that so difficult without being in the studio with somebody. All right, I've kind of done it for a couple of people that I know pretty well. Um, and I'm one, actually the very first lesson that one of them asked for, the first thing he asked for was, I've got a problem with the connection on this step. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And then I had to find a way of explaining how the connection feel, feels to be able to do what he wanted to do. And actually, I, was, I thought I was quite clever the way I got it over it. Yeah, so you you have to adapt, don't you? I mean, it's, I mean, it's going to be quite a while, yeah, I guess. I mean, it's starting to look a little better around the world, but it's going to be a long time yet. So I guess it's going to be something I'm going to have to get used to a little bit more. But yeah, it's not my... Actually, and the other, the girl of that same partnership did say, uh, actually, I prefer it like this way because it's less painful. <laughs> I have no idea what she meant by that. Then. So Graham... Tell us, who, who are you? Who is Graham Oswick? Oh dear. How long have you got? <laughs> as, long as, as long as you have. <laughs> Might have to do an hour spot plot every day. Who is Graham Oswick? I don't know. Well, Graham Oswick, uh, how far back do you want to go? Okay, I'll, lead, I'll, I'll let you take the lead. Okay, do you mean? That's a low person. I don't know. I mean, Graham Oswick is somebody who's absolutely in love with dancing. I guess that would be my first thing. It's, it's been my life since I was eight years old, joining classes that my mum sent me to uh, in Burton's Dance Centre in Hemel Hempstead many moons ago. Uh, yeah, and I mean, she's regretted it ever since, but there you go. Uh, yeah, I mean, dance has always been something I knew I was going to do. And when I was at school, I mean, I wasn't amazing at school, but I was pretty okay. Uh, but I always knew that this is what I was going to do. And the funny thing is, I think even when I was competing, you know, and those of you that know me know I've had a kind of a, a bit of a checkered career as far as competing goes, that uh, I always knew that I was going to be a teacher. That was the thing I loved. You know, I had a strange career, I suppose, compared to some of the other people you've interviewed this in these sessions. Uh, but I mean, that, that whole thing of two people dancing together and, being able to make that feel good and feel good and therefore look good is something that I, I love. The thing of dancing to music and expression of music. I, I suppose myself personally, I, I just, I love people. I, I like being around people. I like, so this is, as you like, I suppose like many dancers are probably similar. Being cut off from everybody is really difficult. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I found that pretty hard, I must say. I mean, you know, you try and keep in contact with somebody, like not actually being able to physically hug them. Anybody that knows me, I'm pretty tactile. So I'm a pretty good hugger. I do it well and a lot. And I really enjoy that side of it. And I find that really hard. And the two things, that, that tactile thing and the dancing together, two things that fit for me. And I think that, I suppose that's in essence who I am. And I shop at Waitrose. So, and Graham, how, how do you think people see you? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty good question. How do I think people see me? I think they see me as probably being quite loud sometimes. Uh, I know that from a judging perspective, I mean, I guess I'll tell you a story because I'm sure you won't mind me telling you when 
when Mark Ballas was competing when he was a junior and I was judging one competition, uh, I think it was the London Championships, and after the competition, which he won, I'd marked him fourth and I was, you know, next with Shirley and Corky, I was you know, one of his main teachers. And he, he came to me the next lesson and he said, why do you keep looking at me like that? And I said, look at you like what? He said, you look like you wanted to kill me the whole time. I, and I think it's just because when I'm watching something and I'm judging, because I find judging difficult, uh, that I really have to concentrate on it. And, I, and my face, therefore, always has that kind of quite strong look, like I'm maybe disapproving, I don't know. I remember when I, I used to work for the National Health Service when I left school. That was my, my you know, when I had a proper job. Uh, and the hospital manager that I, where I worked, when we had director's meetings, he always said to me, I always know when you're upset by something because your eyes go black. Uh, so I suppose, yeah, so I, I don't know, I don't know. You could ask some of them how they see me. So, yeah, Victoria Martin says you're way too honest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in a good way and a bad way. I think that you could take that. Well, you, Jake, you've been on the receiving end of that, haven't you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not good at lying. I'm really, I'm not good at it. Not even when I need to be, I'm not good at it. I really, because I can't, I can't see the point of saying that you're good when you're not. Although I think I can be quite good at channeling it around and knowing the people I'm working with and thinking how I should deliver that. I mean, we all know, you know, certain sectors, let's call it that, uh, attacks, the big competitions, you know. And I think you have to be so careful because even within a partnership, you can have two completely diverse personalities and one needs stroking and encouraging and the other one will need slapping. Uh, and you, those kind of things, I think, are difficult. I mean, yeah. But I, yeah, I suppose I'm pretty honest in that way. And I, I like to think, I mean, if anybody else agrees, who's watching this would agree, but I like to think I'm pretty honest when I judge. I mean, I've, I've quite often lost my own couple's competitions. I'm quite good at that. Uh, Yoka says hi from London and Sue Pedvin Wade says I see Graham as an honest, caring, friendly, loving person. Oh, thank you, Sue. I love you. I watched Sue Pedvin's page because there was a bit of her dancing with Gary Richardson I saw yesterday. Very nice. Well um, So Graham, tell us a little bit about your childhood and um, where you grew up, um, what your parents did, how you actually um, came to dancing. Okay. Sorry, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to drop you in it. Really, I'm not. Uh, so, yeah, I was born in Hemel Hempstead, which is was originally one of the new towns outside of London, uh, where, I, yeah, my, I went to Martindale Primary School and the Halsey School, the senior school, both of which have been demolished since. I don't know if that was anything to do with me, but neither of them exist anymore. Um, yeah, I... I grew up, I did like normal things. I started my mum. I was always one of those irritating kids. I was always dancing around to music anywhere. It really didn't matter where. And uh, there's lots of, you know, <laughs> this is age, this is going to date me now. Cine films we have at home. Uh, my dad was taking cine films when I was a kid. And of me, like jigging around by the swimming pool, jigging around at home. And, and yeah. So at the age of eight, my mum took me to what was then the Burton School of Dancing, Keith and Christine Burton, who were professional ballroom semi-finalists, which I didn't know at the time, obviously. And yeah, and I started my Saturday afternoon classes there. Uh, for many years, went all through the medalist system. Um, and then in our school, we I mean, I was so lucky, really. I mean, that that we had that school in that, that town. And because we used to have on the... I can't remember, the first or last Friday of every month. I mean, you can imagine this happening now. Uh, a party night in the studio and we in-house competitions. And so there were lots of us there. And we always had uh, the top couples coming to demonstrate. So Richard and Janet, Mike and Lorna, Alan and Hazel, Michael and Vicky, et cetera, et cetera. All the people, Len Goodman and Cherry Kingston, all the sort of top couples of the time every month. So I saw one of the best couples in the world dancing every month. So in that way, I was so lucky. Uh, and I always remember, and I always like to remind Lorna of this, that when uh, they were doing a demonstration, and they always used to end their demonstrations with a snowball rumba. Or just a kind of rumba, I think it was. 
uh, which means like they would start dancing, they'd stop the music, they'd split up and go and get somebody out of the audience and then it goes on so it snowballs so you've got lots of people on the floor. And when uh, I was the first one she picked, so I don't know how old I was then, but I don't know, 10, 11 or something like that, I suppose. So I like to remind you, she was already demonstrating professional, I was, you know, a juvenile. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was like an amazing moment when she looked at me, pointed at me and I had to get up on the floor with, you know, the amazing Lorna Lee. So that was an incredible experience. Yeah, and I grew up through the dancing school. I started competing. They took us. One of the fathers up to uh, a competition, which I don't really remember where it is, was even. Uh, and that was our first thing to open competition. So I started open competition when I was about 13, I guess. Uh, and then, again, another story, there was a... The, the junior champion at the time were Gordon Cuthbertson and Carol Dixon, and they were just incredible dancers. You know, when they turned uh, amateur, they mo went more or less straight into the final. Uh, and that was, we went to a competition and my, we were sitting next to them at the competition. I think it was at the Tottenham Royal. And they were talking, they, they were saying how they went to competitions every Sunday. Every, and I always remember my dad so clearly saying, well, we're never going to be doing that. And about three months after that, we were doing competitions every Sunday. And it's just, it was just infectious. You know, it was just, once you get into that thing, and you know, my whole family, I mean, my brother, bless him, uh, was very tolerant of the whole thing because obviously I, I had to travel a lot to competitions. And, you know, my, my first outside of the school teacher was actually Pamela McGill and Jeffrey Clapton who was her partner at the time and Jeff went on to be my my manger coach until very sadly he died um, and then I used to go that he, they were teaching in Harrow and then I used to go I started when I was about 15 I used to go to Michael and Lorna uh, at the top of the stairs in Streatham so uh, where I lived down the M1 through the centre of London and obviously to competition so yeah that was my childhood I guess in the back of a car, asleep on the mum's up on the way to the competition. What did your parents do, Graham? My dad was a carpenter and joiner. So he he worked in a lot of the big houses in London. So he was a what they called a subcontractor. So they'd bring him in to do work. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he was good. I have to say he was really good. And, like, in those times, the that trade was really good and it paid well. And sadly, he said, you know, we had that, the big building crash and that was when he retired. My mum was a uh, full-time job looking after me and my brother, really. Uh, <laughs> you can't imagine that you would need somebody full-time to do that, can you? But, yeah, so my mum was a, a, a stay-at-home housewife, but yeah, she was, uh, yeah, did everything. So, Graham, you're getting some comments. Julie Fryer says that you're an open person with lots of knowledge and great to dance with. And uh, Ala Pilipenko says that um, you're a unicorn in the dance world. <laughs> <laughs> and Ryan Hammond says two words, duck pancakes. <laughs> is, there, is there a story behind that? Yeah, Rob, let him tell you. You can have to you here again. <laughs> and Pam says, thanks so much for mentioning Jeffrey. Yeah, well, he was, uh, I mean, he, Jeffrey Clapham was, just a genius, really. I mean, quite ahead of his time, I would have said. I mean, there were lots of us that came, were trained by Richard Porter, myself, uh, Ara Stubbington, Matthew Cutler. I mean, he had a hand in a lot of good dancers, really. He was just a genius. And well, like, he, he had that brilliant skill to me of being able to teach two people in a partnership differently um, mm -hmm. and still sort of keep you on track, keep you together. But do it in the way that you needed it. I think that's such a skill as how to address different people in one partnership to get the same end result. But yeah, brilliant man. And and he he was the same. You know, every nobody had a bad word to say about Jeff. And I remember he used to have a uh, a flat in Hammersmith, and I think I was a June. I can't remember why, but we had to pick him up once to take him to a competition, and I think it might have been the UK even. Uh, and we went to his flat, and Jeff was unique. Best we could say. Yeah, it was unique. Yeah. And so we got to the flat, and his shirt was hanging up on the 
on the rail. So, but, you know, Jeff was did it economy. So he only ironed the front and the cuffs. So nothing else was up. <laughs> and I think it was my mum who said, you can't go like that. Like, well, what if you have to take your jacket off? So my mum then ironed the rest of the shirt. I think it was my mum, isn't it? <laughs> it was absolutely nuts really Genius. so graham tell us a little bit about your dance journey so obviously you went through the the system the english system so when did you start to take it seriously competitively and tell us a little bit about your your journey with your various partners oh what's the next, we need an extra couple of hours now, now i can tell you this that i was not good with my partners that, that I, I have learned it's just put this out there from the beginning right yeah i had a i had a when i was an amateur youth amateur i had a lot of partners i had one partner as a junior so i as I said, and she was also from the school that i went to so i started with one girl called claire thoroughgood who was a redhead like me uh so can you imagine how cute we were like two gorgeous redheads and my hair was like down here with a flick at the back it was like i mean i was ahead of the time let's face it um and then i changed to a, a and actually we swapped partners and then i danced with a, a girl called debbie brewster and claire danced with a guy, boy called richard and that was when we kind of started to do more of the open competitions really and with debbie we won the internet well again not a strange story but we used to dance the international at the royal album Hawes, juniors and juveniles so i never competed as a juvenile so only as a junior so but because the competition was getting big you had to choose to do ballroom or latin you couldn't do both now at the time i was a ballroom dancer but we'd worked out that there were a lot of strong ballroom dancers that were all going to pick it to do the international so we thought well we'll do the latin because it's not that important a year it was our kind of first time so we we did that and we made the final and came third so it was kind of like we were shot into this final that we weren't expecting at all and actually you mentioned Lorraine I mean she marked me five first that year I'll never forget it it was like you know that this icon of our business uh it marked me five first like I was this little shit from nowhere that just appeared on the scene um and then the following year we won the international and watch I might tell you that and she marked me third that year <laughs> so I went off her a bit for a while uh, <laughs> But yeah, that's fine. Um, and then I turned, Debbie stayed another year as a junior. So she won the ballroom the following year with a different partner, Robert Hawkins. I think so. Um, and then I started, yeah, I, well, yeah. <laughs> Beverly Reese, Lisa Gosling, Michelle Bridger, uh, how should we go, Jane Littleton. I put some pictures up earlier that Jane sent to me. Uh, uh, who else? Uh, Jane, I was probably the most longest with. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, I wasn't good. And um, I always remember my dad, mum and dad saying to me that you know you you've got to look after your partners better. And for because for me the logic of it all, stupid as I was then, was that you know I was when I was with them in a lesson or practice or doing the competition, I was there. 100% I was like and I was really I'd get really uptight if they weren't there but once the competition was over I was gone I was off with my mates and you know messing around and you know that was when my parents said like you know you really should not like, look after your partners and make them feel like you know you're part of the partnership and I never did that so yeah so they pretty much got fed up with me uh, so I, I wasn't pleasant to be around I guess as much as I wanted to do it, I didn't really know how the right way to do it was, I guess. Uh, yeah, and then I, uh, then I took a break. And I, then I danced with, then I decided I would dance professional. So I danced with a girl called Helen Lennon. Uh, so we competed professional. We won the national, what used to be called the national championship. We, won, but we had a great time. We loved doing the shows. Um, and in the, then I had a five year gap, and during that time, I mean, there was I have things go strange and turn around. So then I did, I danced with Pamela McGill, you know, my, my first outside the school teacher, and we did shows together. I must have been for about five years, and we, and we did a lot of shows, a lot of school shows. I absolutely loved it. Absolutely, I mean, because anybody that knows Pam knows what a nutter she is. So, you know, we had, <laughs> We had a we had a lot of, a lot of laughs and a lot of good times together. 
Um, and then Cara Stubbington sent me a message to say, would I be interested in dancing with her? So this was difficult for me because I, like, I've been teaching for five years. I had a pretty full diary, which I kind of built up myself because I didn't have, you know, the titles that most people do when they retire. So I had to build up my own work from my own perspective. And so I decided to have a try. We decided to do the trial. So bear in mind that Cara is exact, almost exactly 10 years younger than me. Uh, so we, we used to have lessons. I used to have lessons with Joan Knight occasionally. So Joan was coming down to the Starlight to teach. So we booked a couple of hours with Joan and we did this trial. Well, not surprisingly, because I'd done a little bit of work with Cara and you know, her former partners and things. So we talked about it. Never taught them exactly, but we were closest. I was close with the family. Uh, so we did a try. Obviously, it felt good because she was a Jeffrey Clapham girl. So obviously, the style thing was not at all. Uh, and I still wasn't sure. I think like, no, I, I'm judge. I was by that time. I was starting to judge some sort of reasonably big competitions. And we all know how the system works. So if I went back to competing and the results weren't good, then there would have been people that I was teaching that wouldn't have had lessons because it would have probably not looked good for them. So we sat down after the lesson and I sat with Bill and Bobby and I will never, ever forget him saying to me, well, you can't regret what you've done, only what you haven't done. And that was like, okay, when I got to school, it was like, okay, I'm going to do it. Because this was my chance to dance, really not knowing I've had five years of teaching and knowledge and thinking about all the problems I've had in the past and not being good. And obviously, Cara and I had always got on really well together. So it wasn't going to be an issue. So yeah, so I was like, do it. And I guess, yeah, we, we did really well. We were together about two years, I think. That came, it was just amazing. You know, and our first competition, was Blackpool. And I will tell you here and now, I recommend to anybody, don't do it. It was terrifying. I mean, the, the fact that it's Blackpool anyway is pretty terrifying. But the fact that you're doing Blackpool after a five year absence from the floor and you've got a bit of credibility as a teacher, so people are going to watch you on that basis too, was terrifying. And the following year, we were saying that was so about, yeah, about eight. Um, yeah, by the time we danced together, I suppose it was about 15 months that we danced together. Yeah, and there's following you who was surprised that I lost it on rule 11. Can you believe that? Bump who won, who won that year? Paul Richardson won. Oh, oh, yeah, I still, I, I still, when I've seen that video of the announcement of the results, it still makes me go cold when I hear Bill's announcement on rule 11. It's like, I, I wanted to kick him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, and then was Clara your last partner? Yes. Yeah, at the time, um, and again, the situation, it's amazing how situations change. It was Cara that made me come back onto the floor. And then I knew that she was already seeing, so, was she married? No, she was already, I don't know whether she was married by then or not. But anyway, she, I knew that she wanted a family. That was the point. And I somehow, I got the feeling that maybe, the, uh, not dedication to dance, because that was never an issue, but because we never, I, mean, I can say we never really argued. I mean, we had lots of debates about things, but we never really had, we never had a bad time together. Uh, but yes, I could tell that she really wanted to stop and have a family. And it was me. We were on the flight on the way back. We'd made the semi-final of the World Masters, I think. And we were on the way back. And I said to her, like, you know, you need to stop dancing now, don't you? <laughs> so we had a whole conversation. About, like, well, I could tell that that was where she wanted to go. So yeah, so she, we did Blackpool. And that was our last competition. We danced the, the pro, we made the 24 and all five dances. Um, that we stopped that night. And no, nobody knew we were going to stop, but that, that was our last comp. But you know, I'm, I'll be eternally grateful to Cara because that opportunity to get back on the floor and do it properly, you know, which I hadn't really done previously, uh, yeah, it was a great opportunity for me. And it was like, it was, I, I felt it was a, when I think about what Bill told me, it was actually the right thing. Totally. So Graham, looking back, and it doesn't need to necessarily be a competitive result, but what was your biggest accomplishment in your dancing? As results, what? Well, it doesn't have to be results, no. It just as on a personal level, like what do you feel is your biggest accomplishment as a competitor? Woo. 
I think getting onto a floor, having practiced, had my lessons practiced really hard, understood what my teachers wanted me to do, partly, uh, and being able to get out there and just do it. I mean, just I mean that feeling of having two people together on the floor who are in harmony and connected and that, that music plays whether it be Ashley or well, normally Ashley isn't it uh, and feeling that you're part of the whole thing is just just the most amazing feeling just the most amazing feeling I think I'm all right I think the results to boot great I mean, I have to tell you another story, actually. I just thought of it, it made me just laugh through my head. We were dancing the Nationals in the November, and we danced the first round. And I don't remember why, but Kara, in the first round, was terrified. And she, she went like a block of wood. And I didn't know what to do, because I thought, if I start saying something, I think I'm going to say probably something I shouldn't do. So I went to Lynn Harmon, who was my coach when I was professional. I said to her, please go and talk to Kara because, you know, she needs help or I'm going to kill her. I don't, uh, so it was funny because Lynn took it. I didn't know until, I didn't know until after, but Lynn had taken her to the bar, got her a brandy for her to sit just to calm herself. And, and Kara necked the whole thing. Anyway, when she came back, we, I mean, I will never forget that rumba. I can remember where I was dancing even on the floor. It was like, well, it was like a rape scene to music. As well. <laughs> it was like, it was, it was amazing. It was like, it was just an amazing feeling. I'll never forget that one. That was incredible. Yeah. So Graham, what's been uh, your biggest regret in your career? Yeah, probably my mishandling of my previous partners, I guess. I think I think I could have, on hindsight, or definitely on hindsight, I could have done it all better. I, it's, and it's like, well, I suppose everybody will tell you the same thing, like we all do. If I'd have known then what I know now about how things work and the best way, and I'm always talking to the couples that I work with about the way they relate together, you know, and what is the point of arguing? Because it just doesn't get you anywhere. And if you have a problem and you can't practice together, or it's not can't practice, but it's got to a stage where it's become unpleasant in the atmosphere between you then separate for 20 minutes or just have the balls to say okay this is not working let's go and have a coffee or let's go out for dinner and something and come back when you when you're you've had a breath and a chance to think about it and come back and do it again so i would say yeah i, would say that I could have done the first part of my career better having said that if i'd have done that would i have had the much enjoyment that i've had since or well, with you know, with partners and on. I don't know. So would I be where I am now if I'd done it the other way? I don't know. So I mean, yeah, is it a regret? I don't know. I just think, yeah, I could have definitely managed and been nicer to my partner. So I apologise to Jane Burns, as she is now, Beverly, all the, the list. I'll write you a list on Facebook. Um, Graham, who have been your major influences in your career, um, learning-wise, teacher-wise? Oh, I mean, top. Jeffrey Clapham will always be the the guy that so much to me and did so much for me. So yeah, definitely top of the list. I mean, I'm I'm lucky. I I mean, this, when I was competing, I hate this. I hate that phrase. When I was a boy, uh, we didn't have so many teachers that, as the couples today, and I think that is a problem in today's dancing, one hundred percent, because you know. Everybody has lessons with everybody. Uh, so they're obviously a lot richer than we were. But um, but I think you lose focus. So my main, in the end, let's say, because I suppose the bit before, I mean, Jeff was the one who built me into what I became as a, as a dancer, I suppose, fundamentally. But my main coach when I was professional was Lynn Harmon. And Lynn, Lynn's, and it was weird because I'd never had lessons with Lynn before. And obviously, I was already teaching in the studio at the time, so I got to know Lynn, and I kind of I loved the way Lynn works. I mean, everything, the detail and the touch and the feel, and it was all about what I wanted to do. I mean, anybody that thinks I'm picky, you want to have a lesson with Lynn, because Lynn is really picky. I mean, a genius teacher, a very a very underrated, I would say, also. 
Uh, and then, of course, I had people like Mick and Lorna. Mick was my first, like, London teacher when I was 15. And I have, I'm going to tell you a story about this. You'll kill me. But we went for a lesson one day. So my dad used to drive us all the way to Streatham, to the top of the stairs, which used to be, like, in Streatham High Road. And we got there for the lesson. Mick wasn't there. So Lorna said, uh, don't worry, I'm going to take you today. So we'd never had lessons with Lorna. We only had Mick. So I'm going to take you today. So, so we said, well, where's Mick then? So she said, you know, Mick was famous for always being ill. You know, he, was, he was always worried he had something. You know? So he said, and she said, I left him at home this morning with Cara, who was their youngest daughter, who was about four, I guess, at the time, laying across his chest, counting his heartbeat out for him. I always, I always have that picture in my head. Yeah. And then I had professional lessons with Lorraine. Um, and I'd had other teachers previous to that uh, in, with other partners because of the situation. Like when I danced with Jane, I had lessons with Sammy and Shirley, as it was then. And actually, that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting thing because my, my education as an amateur from Jeff, because he was such a soft, rhythmical, musical dancer, which is where I'd like to think I got all that bit of me from. Uh, and then Jane had, had had a lot of lessons with Sammy and Shirley, it was like Sammy and Shirley, uh, as it was then. And so I went for lessons. And I found that really difficult because Sammy was such an opposite force for me. It was just so opposite to what I'd done before. Sammy was about moving, big shapes, be seen, compete. And I found that really hard because it was just my antithesis of what I knew. But actually, when I look back at that, I think like, well, that was actually for me the absolutely the right thing at that time because I needed that. I mean, I'd have, I'd have my hands like this the whole time, and something like, just put your arms out, keep still, <laughs> like stretch. <laughs> and he had a, they had a studio in Manchester which had an art tech ceiling, which is like a rough ceiling. And I remember doing, you know, when leaps were possible and uh, popular in past you know, like these leaps going down the room. So I, had, I think three going down the room. And I used to hit the back of my hand on the ceiling and it was bleeding. And, you know, as people that will know Sammy was, Sammy say, just do it again. So <laughs> it bleeding. So it doesn't matter, just go again. But that was his, his, the way he taught it. Was, his teaching was a lot about the competing. So yeah, I mean, it was interesting, like the complete opposite. So I, I, I had various influences, but Lynn Harmon was my main coach as when I was my last stage of my career, I guess. Graham, how do you define success? Oh dear. Well, I guess the popular, the popular is being the champion. I mean, let's face it, that's what we all start out to do, isn't it? I mean, nobody starts competing to go into, come out in the first round. That's, nobody starts with that ambition or being a finalist, I suppose. We all start to be the champion. Uh, and if you don't make it as a champion, it doesn't mean you failed. And I think success is a, is a strange word. I mean, you know, like I said before, I'm, I feel, I mean, yeah, I would love to have competed in it. Actually, at the time when Cara stopped, at that time, I would have gone on dancing if for a little bit longer, if there'd have been somebody right there available that we clicked with. But you know, there wasn't, and I wait. And after six months, it's like, no, I'm not going through all that again. Waiting and coming back again, it's, it's done. Now. So I was great. You know, I've used the knowledge that I got from teachers, partners, experience, you know, and I channeled it into another way because I always knew I was going to be a teacher. That was that was always the end game, I think. And obviously, the compete. You know, if you're successful, that brings automatic work. But it doesn't make you a good teacher. Uh, so, it's, yeah, success. I, success is like being happy, isn't it? Yeah. If you're, if you're happy, you're successful. I mean, you know, how can I complain? I've judged every major competition in the world from being, uh, I wouldn't say an unsuccessful competitor, but not being a, you know, somebody that talks about as I'm not talked about as a dancer. Let's face it. Uh, do you remember when he made that final rise and black? I mean, you know. You can dig the DVD somewhere, 1996. Um, <laughs> if, it's, if it's still in print, well, yeah. <laughs> probably on cinefilm. Uh, yeah, I guess success is about being happy. 
Listen, I mean, I'm so lucky. I, I travel the world at other people's expense. I meet amazing people all the time. You know, like those list of names you were reading out at the beginning. You know, when, when those, the people whose lives you've touched in any way, small or large, you know, some people you work a lot with, some people you do a little bit with and everything in between. When I, you know, those names, I get messages like Victoria Martin, you know, just because one you rang out earlier, you know, you know, I, I get messages from her and Sante that she danced with, Valentin Chemakovsky, and people like that just out of the blue will send you a message about, oh, I really miss your lessons or something like that. And it's like, wow, like, I'm surprised you even remember. I mean, it's like a hundred years ago. Uh, and I think when you've touched so many people's lives, I mean, it would be amazing somehow if you could actually work out how many people you've taught over the course of your career. Yeah. That, that would be, I mean, absolutely impossible. But you know, you travel around the world, you meet new people. I mean, I, I like traveling, I have to say, because I, I get bored fast with myself as well. And, you know, I teach in the studio in Dance Options, which I absolutely love. We have a great studio, a great, great group of people that we teach together with there. And that, that's amazing. But I get bored and I go, I think, to Italy or to Moscow or wherever. And I teach and I'm teaching the same rubbish, but I'm in a new environment. So it, somehow it feels different. And because they have a different culture, the way they react to you is different. So it's, you know, yeah, yeah. So Graham, um, was there a, a dark time uh, in your career or a really low point, um, maybe where you thought about stopping or quitting or you had um, some trouble and you managed to overcome that and continue? Um, was there a time like that and if so, how, what motivated you to continue? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, now we're going deep, aren't we? Uh, uh, mm, yeah, there was. I think probably a couple of times. I think... I, I, Surely everybody must have, you must have a point in your career. I mean, nobody can be happy all the time, can they? And I'm pretty good at putting it out there that I, I you know, everybody thinks I'm like super personality. But, you know, everybody has dark times. Everybody. And, you know, I get, I get very upset when the political things, certain political things happen. And I, I remember, you know, one period when, there was some stuff going on that I really didn't like. And I really got to the point that I don't know what the point of this is. I'm teaching this this subject, this type of subject, a technical thing or a type. And I, what bloody use is that to them? Because if that's going to happen in the competition. But then I, then I, you know, I, have, I have a couple of weeks of that. Uh, I was backed by a couple of people, my closest friends. And... Uh, then I think, yeah, and then I dance again, or I touch somebody, or you, and it can be anybody. You know, I've, I've been so lucky in my career as a teacher. I'm I've taught the best. And, I've taught, and I started actually when I first taught in this obviously the studio where I started. And then I used to go to Electrolux, the company. I used to teach every Wednesday night a two hour class or somewhere like that. I learned so much about I mean, so much of that. It was incredible. And uh, I think that, that's something people are learning and bringing you back. Once I get, somebody, somebody can be quite pure. And you do something and you see their face light up that something just changed in them and they feel it. And you see they feel it, and they feel there's something better about what they do. And it's amazing. It's just the most amazing feeling to, to be able to do that with somebody. I love that. I love that. I, I, if I have a couple who I can see are really not wanting to do what I want them to do, and that happens, obviously, because not everybody wants to do what you want to do. And let's face it, some of them have lessons not really wanting to do what you want to do in the first place anyway. But then I, Lynn taught me that. You know, like, your job is to make them believe you so and even though they didn't come in to do what you wanted them to do the fact that, that what you're asking them to do makes them feel better makes them feel good and therefore it wasn't a waste of money so yeah i mean yeah so yeah i've had dark times but i mean i i, I hand on heart i can't say that i've had anything traumatically bad periods of depression mind depression graham how do you handle stress and pressure Ignore it. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I'd like to say I drink a lot, but I don't. But uh, I don't know. I have to. I just have to. Go, I have to move myself back from it. I I do get stressed, very stressed about certain things. Um, but yeah, I, I like to think I've got better as I've got older. For example, like uh, some people know that by on research of the BDF and that job comes with a, a lot of work. I mean, a lot of work. If you think about all the things the BDF organized and I'm the secretary, so most of the written stuff is done by me and organizing judges and things like that. Um, and there have been several times when I'm really stressed over that because there's so much coming in. And obviously the busy times for the BDF are the busy times when I'm teaching. So before the UK, before Blackburn, before the international, everything's happening in that period. So I've, then I, sometimes I, I've got really stressed. But as I've got older, I've got a bit better at it. Because I think, well, if it doesn't get done, it doesn't get done. I can't, I'm not superhuman. I've tried to be. And I'm lucky because, you know, I'm the one person. So I haven't got to worry about my kids or looking after my wife or anything like that. So I, I, suit, my, I suit my own times. So I just take more holidays. That's the best. That's the best. Take more holidays. That's the best advice. Um, Graham, do you have a philosophy on how you live your life? Enjoy it. You were, this is, there is no rehearsal. There's no rehearsal for a good life. If you've got something that you want to do, go and do it. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. Go and do it. And if you don't, if you go and do it and you don't like it and you're not successful at it, it doesn't matter, does it? Because below the game, is it? You can't regret what you've done, or what you haven't done. You can't all. You can't be looking back, thinking, "I wish I'd done." That but it's too late. Like, for example, for me, if I'd have gone on another four years, it would have been too late to go back to me. And then I would have always had bitterness in me that I could have done that. But I went and did it. I did all right. It wasn't amazing, but I did all right. So that was a satisfying period of my life. And I can always look back and think, like, thank God Bill told me to do what he did. I don't know if I would have done it otherwise, because I really wasn't sure. But his work, really, was his work. It's, it was so important. Don't let anyone tell you you can't. You can. Graham, what are your strengths and weaknesses as a person? <laughs> Probably the same, really. My strength is my honesty. My weakness is my honesty. <laughs> because if I don't like something, I have to face it. I, oh yeah, I don't know if that's a, yeah, I think it's a bad thing sometimes, not always, but sometimes it's a bad thing. I can't sit, I don't, I don't take fools gladly. I don't, I don't take fools gladly. I'm just going to plug my phone in because I'm losing power. I don't want to cut you off in midstream. Yeah. yeah I don't is, take fools gladly. I find that cool. is there something you can tell us that people don't know about you? Something interesting? I love lemon and pepper chicken from Waitrose. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. If you haven't tried it, you have to go and get it. It's the best. Uh, mm, I don't know. I think I'm pretty... What you see is what you get. I don't think there's anything hidden about me. I mean, I do... I suppose, yeah, the thing that you don't see very often publicly in me, I suppose, is I'm pretty sensitive. I mean, most people think I'm a rhinoceros, I'm pretty sure, but... I mean, you asked that, I could have said that at the beginning, like, what is it, how do they see me? I, I, yeah, I think probably think I'm a bit of an elephant, really. Like, I can resist most things, but I get pretty upset. I'm pretty sensitive, I would say. Uh, and, but I don't, I don't tend to let the people see that because I don't think it's their problem. That's, that's for me to deal with. So, yeah, probably, probably that. Graham, if you had an autobiography, what would the title be? <laughs> Osmicology at work. I don't know. The idiot who did all, who did well or something. I don't know. I made it. Okay, nice. Um, at what age were you the happiest? Um, I would say I'm probably well, not not directly right now in this Corona situation, but I would say yeah, these last. 10 years have been amazing. I mean, I've done some amazing things in, in my career. Yeah. And I wait, yeah, in some ways, I can look back at some of the times when I thought I probably wasn't happy. And actually, I was. I enjoyed 
you know, if you look back at some of the things you did and, you know, I always say that to people, you know, everything you have done or been through has brought you to where you are now. Oh, yeah. So every good or bad thing that happens in your life will bring you to the current position. And you wouldn't be the person you are without those things. And of course, I do have to tell myself that sometimes when I'm having my dark days. But yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, how could I not be happy? I get, I get paid to do this. It's ridiculous. Well, not this. But I mean, am I getting paid to do this? No. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I get paid to travel around the world. I get paid to teach people to dance, to part, to pass on my enthusiasm and my way of doing things to other people, you know, super talented people. I mean, who couldn't get with that? I have a house, I have a car, I have great friends. Uh, yeah, I get to do, I mean, you know, I'm doing this. I mean, how could I not be happy? Yeah, I agree. So, Mr. Oswick, if I walked into a studio and I saw you teaching a lesson, what would I see and what would I hear? Uh, a lot of like, ouch, kind of sounds <laughs> probably. Uh, you um, what would you say? I guess I think that really depends on who's in front of you, because again, I think the the success of a teacher is being able to assess what that couple need at this time, and not just keep giving them the same old crap week in and week out, and the same couple every piece of information. Now, I know people are. Whoever's watching this, some of these are going to be laughing now. I think like, well, everybody gets the rib knee foot thing, don't they? I mean, yeah, they're starting to comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm not even going to leave that story. Thank you, Rangel. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, see, my, my principle, or I suppose my problem is uh, I, everybody I basically get sees me as being a technician, which I don't think I am. But my problem is I can't bypass the fact that you've got your feet turned in or you can't stand up when you make a quarter of a turn to the right and talk about musicality because I just can't see the point. So I always end up going back to your feet are not doing the right thing. You haven't got pressure on the floor. You didn't drop your weight. You didn't breathe. So I, I know that everybody thinks that that's what I'm about. But you now that thing when you can get past that and talk to them about feeling what they're doing and the sensing of a weight of another of another body. I think that that's really what I'm about. But I can't bypass that. When what's the point? You can't turn to the right without wobbling. What is the point of talking about musicality unless you're going to musicalize the wobble? I don't know. So I guess you'd, you'd hear a lot about you'd hear a lot about feet, as everybody will know. Yeah, because if you can't use your feet, you might as well just pack up and go home. So, yeah. so, so Graham, so the, I mean, you've answered some of it, but my next question was going to be, what are you about as a coach and what sets you apart? Well, Ribney Foot definitely sets me apart. I, mean, I hope you copyrighted that. that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, in fact, I've, I've even got a key ring with it on. Uh, yeah. Victoria I'm, says you can make a tree trunk dance. <laughs> <laughs> I would like, yeah. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, I hope you weren't including yourself in that. Um, yeah, I'm, actually, though, that comment is interesting because many people will say to you, and maybe not at the highest level, but like if you take lower couples, like a, uh, somebody who's come to dancing later, so if they dance senior or something like that, and they'll, yeah, but I can't do that. You know, and my answer is like, you've got two legs and two arms the same as everybody else. So unless you've got some handicapped, Thing that I don't know about. Why not? It's only a question of being. If you if you can hear music, that would be the only thing that could stop you doing it. If you really, because some, some people really can't hear music. That um, that must be torture. I mean, that must be torture. I can't even begin to imagine how that must feel. Uh, but yeah, it, and teaching somebody to dance and being able to dance on that floor. I mean at any level and giving them the confidence and the the balls to like get out there and do it like stop holding back get out there and do it there's no reason why you shouldn't do it like get out and do it have a go i, I think that's that's really what i love i think 
Adelma's got a great question. How did rib knee foot start? Where was the inspiration? <laughs> <laughs> it started. I mean, quite, I mean, there's nothing clever about it, really. But it started because, you know, when you teach, you should always be learning from it. So because anybody that teaches anybody, you will know that you say something to somebody about how you want something to happen. And they, they appear to do the opposite or something quite different. And you think, I didn't say that. But actually, when you translate it back in your own mind, you think, oh, maybe I, perhaps I did. Perhaps I, that's how they read it. Because, you know, you say to something beautiful, well, what is beautiful? What is strong? I mean, everybody could describe strong in 20 different ways and they'd all be right. Uh, so I think it, it came about because I watched Rumble Walks and all I could see is legs. I can only see these this body tilting forward and legs. And well, I suppose going back to your other question, I mean, I'm all about body. I love body movement and rhythmicality. That central rhythm box of your body to me is the most important thing. I love that seeing rhythmical dances. And I was just I just got fed up with seeing like the upper body looking stilted and not nothing happening. So I thought about things that Lynn had said to me about movement and she was always talking about releasing the weight downwards to move uh, and I thought like well actually what what I, what do I move when I think I'm doing it right so I thought about this like bottom of the rib cage part and I thought well if you breathe out or you push that in you have to breathe out and I, it was like a process of thinking like well, what do I do and how could I make that work for a world champion and a medalist at the same time that was my that was my ambition to find a system that worked for everybody, and everybody's now going to tell you that it didn't. But anyway, Graham, do you have a, a story about like your worst lesson ever or worst day of teaching ever? Do you have a funny story? Um, You're thinking God that. every day. Yeah, <laughs> every day the studio runs. No, uh, no, I think I I I have a problem with my own teaching sometimes because I get that because I remember being a competitor too about going in for a lesson and not having a good lesson but you only appreciate that when you're a teacher because like everybody you can't be on the top of your game every day so there are days when you're not good I mean that doesn't mean to say that the information isn't good but maybe the delivery of the lesson isn't great and then I hate those days. I mean, I, I, I hate myself when it happens. And I still think back on the lesson and think, well, they probably got something out of it. And it was, you know, it was probably worth it from that point of view. But I feel like the lesson wasn't good. The information was okay, but the lesson was crap. And I think back to my own teachers. And I, think I had that situation with some of my teachers. I remember, actually, I, the only, I can remember... <laughs> I, just, I, mean, you know, I can think of lots of funny stories. Most of them I can't tell on here, probably. But... <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, that, I'm going to stay there. I don't want to, I don't want to be uh, solicit, uh, offered a writ or something. Uh, Graham, what do you think is the biggest challenge for today's dancers? I don't think the challenge is any different to it, to it as me from the year dot, is it? I mean, you know, we all go out there to be the best dancers we can. And the biggest problem, which I've kind of touched on before, is this thing about too many teachers somewhere along the line that has to end because I, I, mean, I, I mean every generation will tell you that the generation before was better which i don't agree with i mean the dancers now are much better than my generation and the one before that i mean much better you only have to look at the videos come on i mean dancing has developed you know it was brilliant if you look at every one of those things I mean, you can look at videos of Laird and Lorraine, Alan and Hazel, Mick and Dorna, Brian and Karma. And if you want to, you can pick it, you can pull it all to pieces. Because when it was happening, it was great. But then, like everything in every part of life, it moves on and gets better. And you always see, like, where can this go now? And I often think to myself, in 10 years' time, what will we all be doing? Because you, you, you never know where it's going to come from or how it's going to happen. I mean, certain people put certain things very clearly into dancing. You know, a recent one would be Michael and Joanna. They had a very distinctive style of dancing. And, you know, they added this real atmosphere and presence in the way they danced and styling. 
uh, Brian and Carmen. I mean, that, that, you know, you can say that. I mean, you can go back in all generations, Mick and, Mick and Lorna with their Paso, uh, Lorraine with their out there costumes and that vivacious dancing. I mean, you know, everybody brought something to the table, but, you know, the, the level of it's all gone up and up. Uh, so I think that that's, but the problem will be if, if everybody does lessons with everybody, instead of concentrating on themselves, find the teachers that are good for you. No teacher is good for everybody. Nobody. Nobody. Except me, obviously. So I'm well, going to find a way. Uh, what, what do you love about the dance world? I, I would say that the business is so strange, so strange in that there are some nasty people in our business, nasty people. And I guess if you work for Kodak, there are nasty people in Kodak too. I mean, it's like wherever you go, those people exist, don't they? There are lovely people, happy people, miserable people, fat people, thin people. I mean, they, they exist everywhere, not just in dancing. And I think we have to remember that, you know, you know, the politics which exists within our business exists everywhere in every company, in every walk of life. So don't forget that. Don't, don't think it's just dancing. It happens everywhere. You know, just it's unfortunate the judging system is not perfect, but it's the best we've ever found. You know, and having a, you know, a broad panel ultimately gets the right result, generally. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, okay, so the, the, the second part of the question is, what do you dislike most about the dance world? I dislike that everybody has too many lessons. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I mean, I could never say that enough. I, I just don't understand. In fact, I even, I mean, you know, we have this thing like we have a team day and we have a starlight day and da, 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 you know, we, we travel around because obviously you know, it's, it makes sense to have all your lessons in that studio one day, it saves you petrol. Uh, but I, I've actually had it where I actually gave a couple of their money back and said, like, you've had too many lessons today, go on. Wow, really? Yeah, I mean, it's like ridiculous. How can you have how can you have six lessons on one day, on one day, on six different subjects? I mean, you could even have, a, you know, taught by a couple. You know, let's say Alan and Hazel. You know, and you know they'll be the first people to tell you they teach different things. I mean, they have the same principles, but they teach different things and they judge differently. Mm -hmm. So that's still, you know, they'll tell you they they have Alan and Hazel. That's a judge. That's one person. It's not. It's two people. It's two teachers. So every name you mention is another viewpoint. And yeah, I mean, there are, when I think back at my dancing, there were so many people I would love to have had lessons with. Love to have had lessons with. But, you know, once you start, once you're on the merry-go-round, you can't get off, can you? So you just have to keep going round and round and round. And, you know, and they, the couples think we're stupid. You think that we don't know that you, uh, you have one lesson? like before every big competition, and you really think that I think I'm influencing your dancing? I mean, get real. I mean, yeah. we, I think that that's a sad, a sad part. And I think, you know, well, I say Michael and Joanna proved it really, didn't they? I mean, they had a very small number of teachers and still one black for eight years in a row. So it's, it's because they will tell you that it's not possible, but it is because they stuck to something which they really believed in they always start and they always with root was their main teacher and they always stuck to that you know i was brought on to help with the technical aspects of their dancing i mean it's like you know everybody had a role to play they had specific people richard porter you know, at one point doing their choreography i mean everybody had a role to play and they knew exactly we all knew what our role was and i think that's important you, know, you pick a team around you and even i would say let's go one stage further even if you want to do that whole merry-go-round thing, don't try and listen to everybody. At least pick one person who you're going to take it all back to and put it together for you, like I did with Lynn. Now, I'd, sometimes I had lessons with other people, and I thought I didn't get it or I wasn't quite sure it was right, and I'd say to Lynn, well, well you told me that, you told me that, and she's telling me that. I mean, you know, let's face it, everybody's got a version of a rumble walk, haven't they? So yeah, like yeah. everything, and that's the most basic fundamental. Everybody's got a version of it, and it was like, and we, and sometimes I would choose, and Lynn say, "Well, I think you should do the other one," and, but I would pick the other one just to try it. Um, so, 
you've got to ha exercise your own mind. Like, know what you want to do, feel it, try it. And, and if you must do all that, at least have a direction for yourself and trust somebody. Graham Rangel is asking, is being a good dancer enough to be a good teacher? No, absolutely not. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, that is, is that, that whole rolling thing, isn't it? I mean, I wanted to teach, it's what I wanted to do. I mean, some people, when they retire from competing, it's what they do next. It's not necessarily, you know, because they loved to dance love being on a competition floor, but the teaching thing is now they have to do that because they're too old to do the other one. Uh, you know. So yeah, I mean being a being a champion or a top dancer or isn't it enough to teach is because teaching is a whole other subject. And I guess I Nina Hunt will probably be the most, you know, not that Nina did compete. I mean, you know, she's not famous as a competitor like some of the other great coaches were, but she turned out more champions than anybody, I would think. And I think it's like your your understanding of what couples need and yeah, is what makes you a great or hopefully a great teacher that you understand them and you try to get that together with them and work together and not dictate. Graham, do you think do you think it's tougher for women in the industry? Oh, it's always it's uh, women in, in any industry is always tougher, isn't it? I mean, it's getting better. It's absolutely getting. My brother's going to hate this because he hates all this. But anyway, uh, it, it is difficult for a single woman to make her way. It, it's always been that way, but it has got better. I mean, I mean, we've got amazing female coaches, single female coaches. I mean, parts of partnerships for sure, but you've got amazing sing, single women out there teaching that are great and are good. But I guess it's yeah, men are are considered to be hardier somehow i don't know but that's that's in the world isn't it? in general that you know it's a man's you know in the words of it's a man's world uh, and i guess that it's still a bit of an old-fashioned thing i mean you need to have men and women in your team too don't you because although i am an amazing bitch when i dance i get it but you know it's still not the same as the real thing is it it's not the same as the real thing Graham, what are your thoughts on the direction of um, the competitors today in terms of the dancing? Is it going in the right direction? Actually, I had a period where I was a bit concerned about whether we were going the right way, but actually, I think we're on a pretty good track now. I think we, I think, I think we've had, you know, past the champion obviously always sets the goals, don't they? And it's like that's what we aim at to be, or the the younger couples will always look at the top to see what's there. And that's what we copy. So, you know, we've had some great people to copy, you know, and, and this, the next set of champions, like, you know, we've lost our recent champions. So the next set of champions, you know, the people that are there, this, if you look at the Latin, Stefano and Basha, uh, Trolls and Ina, and all those couples that are behind me, you've got an amazing mix of fantastic dancers there. And, and all of them are, I would say, doing the right thing and that that was my concern sometimes in the past you look at uh, me personally of course it's not a reason is i i was looking at thinking i'm not even sure they're trying to do the right thing but now i look at that and i think you know it's not quite right in some cases not quite what i would like but they're all trying to do the right thing they you know they're all working hard so i think i think when i look at that group and in the ballroom probably the same i think the couples if the couples have got something good to look at to emulate then we're safe yeah i hope so uh what's your favorite dance graham cha-cha your least favorite Paso. um if you had children would you encourage them to dance yes who, in your opinion, uh, from the past, was one of the most <laughs> was one of the one of the most underrated dancers or couples in the industry? Someone that quite didn't make it, and you know, maybe deserved more than they got. In your opinion? Oh, oh. Uh, well, Julie Fryer. All right. I mean, we can't say she was underrated. I mean, professional finalist, but amazing dancer, just an amazing dancer. And I, as, as she said to you earlier, I mean. One one time I did a lecture at Blackpool and I asked if she would come and dance with me, and it was it was such a trauma to get it 
together in a way. So she flew in the night before. We talked about it, obviously. Yeah, but she flew in the night before, and in our hotel, we practiced through the night to dance together. Yeah. <laughs> and the idea, and it was, but it was just so easy. I mean, it was just so easy. So yeah, Holger Nietzsche was another amazing dancer. I think, yeah, I and mean, again, also amateur champion. God, I, those questions are difficult when you put you on the spot. I mean, I just those just two names are just shot into my head. I mean, yeah, there's been some amazing. Um, uh, love it, cricket. Me, he's got to be the best, the greatest world champion that never was. Mm -hmm. I guess. So, Graham, um, going but if you look back now, not not considering the woman and the great partners that you had the many in your career. Is there someone that you can think of from the past, maybe, um, that would have been a dream partner for you, you could have seen yourself dancing with, or partnering with? Julie Fay. Damn it. And actually, I can tell you now, we had a tryout, and she picked bloody, who did she pick? Was it Louis, or I can't remember she picked at the time. I mean, it would pick Louis Van Amstel over me. Can you believe that? I mean, seriously? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can you believe that? Yeah, we did have a tryout, though. You know? But yeah, some somebody of that, because what was great about Julie is that she had, she was a woman when she danced, but so she had this kind of natural rhythm and weight about her dancing, which is, I love weight in dancing. That's good. That's important for me. But she also had this amazing artistic a way that she did everything. Made, she made everything look beautiful and it was just unnatural. Un I mean, I, the, I suppose the other thing I can't stand about dancing is the fakeness of it. You know, the pointing, the winking, the, you know, uh, the convulsing. I can't be doing all that. I mean, I love rhythm. It's got to look like it's coming from something. And I think, yeah, so Julie, you turned down such a great time there with me. I'm telling you. It's never too late, eh? Yeah. <laughs> no. I could do the over 50s and I'm getting a bit late for that now. Graham, who is your all-time favorite dancer? And that doesn't necessarily to be in our industry, but just overall, your all-time favorite dancer. Oof. Well, I guess if I'm looking at overall dancers, then I suppose two. Uh, one would be Mikhail Baryshnikov, and the other one would probably be Carlos Acosta. Both ballet dancers, but uh, I mean, both of them. Uh, did other things. Uh, I mean, Carlos Acosta has done some obviously stuff recently as well. I mean, I mean, you ever get a chance to see videos or see them live? And if you look at Mikhail Baryshnikov, he he did a uh, something called the Sinatra Suite, which he dances with Elaine Kudo, and it's like obviously Sinatra music. And he's in a dinner suit, and she's in like an evening gown thing, and it's it's like ballet jazz and all that. it's just beautiful yeah so those two i mean i mean the the list within our business is endless isn't it endless um what is your definition of sexy or beautiful on the dance floor because it gets thrown around a lot isn't it beat oh you need to be more sexy or you need to be this you need to be that so what for you yeah, encapsulates that the whole thing about being sexy is a bit of a non-starter for me, really. But I mean, yeah, because again, it's like everything. It's, it's these these words on it. Like that, what is sexy to you is not sexy to me. I mean, it's it's it, yeah. It, it, you've got to be defined like more more womanly, more attentive to your partner. Those kind of certain things. The way people walk can be sexy. The way they wear their clothes can be sexy, but I, somehow it, you can help people with that. But I don't. They need to. They need to grow into it. It's not something you. It's like the other one is. You need to find a style. I. I mean that's another one I never get. It's something you pick up on the way, isn't it? You know, yeah. we all, you you gather things through your lifetime, long or short, about what your style is. I mean, you can see how stylish I am. And obviously, but, clearly. Uh, yeah, clearly. I mean, it's like something people have often commented on. But, uh, but yeah, you, you pick that up as you go along from, you know, obviously from your family, your your home, your upbringing, the people you went to school with, the area you live in, the people you have lessons with, the people you mix with. I mean, you know, things change. And you know? it's like, you know, you can't find yourself. What was the other one you said? Sexy. And what was the other one you said? Beautiful. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I think class is probably a better word than beautiful because I think beautiful is also subjective, isn't it? I mean, what's beautiful? Well, well classy can could also be subjective, can't it? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> and subjective. I mean, I would like to think that class is something that pe more people would understand because beautiful is definitely, I mean, I could look at painting, I think it's vile. That um, some people would say it's beautiful. I think, like, how can you say beautiful? It's a dot in the middle of a page. How can that be beautiful? But I mean, if something looks as class, you don't have to like it. That that would be my thought. You've got to, if it's got class, I, I don't have to necessarily like it. I can mark it. Like, same, I feel like we're from from judging point of view. I can mark something that I don't like if they do it well. And I can end up actually marking that better than a couple who are doing what I like and doing it badly. Work that out. That's hard. That's why I find judging difficult. Because I know I want to mark that, but I end up marking that. Graham, uh, Rangel has a question. What are, the, what are the three best qualities of a great dancer? Um, what, what, what three best qualities should a great dancer have besides the physical abilities or skills? Mm -hmm. First one's got to be, you have to have a passion for what you do. You have to love it. To, to be good or successful or both, you have to have a passion for it. Because this is it's a hard industry, isn't it? Like, it, it's art it's it's theater so you know you have a lot of obstacles to overcome en route and i think that's very difficult so you and again i suppose what i was saying about you know the dark times it's my passion for dancing and for being given just one thing to that person on that day is enough so i mean definitely a passion for what you do Look at other things outside of your dancing. Don't just get like stuck on this bloody rumble walk thing. Look left and right. Look at go and see other shows. The to to do it because it's like it's all on tap on the end of a finger tap now not, not like you know I, I, when i say it you know, back to when i was a boy you know when i was a kid the only so now it's it's different isn't it you you can watch there was a competition in japan last night you can see it either live or tomorrow morning it's like it's 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 too easy it's almost too easy now so passion look outside your dancing Listen, just listen to the music. Let the music give you something. Let it tell you what to do. Some people, they, they put the music on and they hear the one, two, three, four, but they don't hear anything in between the beats or the vocal or something. Like that. Listen, it will tell you all you need to know. Graham, what is your vision in Latin American dance? My vision? Yeah. I suppose I could almost say that the same my vision is it's latin american dancing so latin america applies there's rhythm and feeling and sensitivity in dance so let's not have all this side by side facing the audience start to finish yeah, i mean i know that has got better but it, it always comes back every so often so you know i think our dance is about two people touching each other and dancing together and a, and a man being able, able to impulse something for the lady to react to whilst doing his own thing and for her to interpret what he gives her and then be able to do her own thing. So I think, and I think any good judge dancer can look at a couple and know whether that's happening or not or whether you're faking it. So, um, all the things you've mentioned, you've probably answered this in some way, shape or form, but I'm going to ask it anyway. It's a double, double sided question. What would you like to see more of on the floor? And what would you like to see less of on the floor? Okay. 
<laughs> Most people will have left knee when I I can't bear standing on one leg. Now I make that clear for people that don't have lessons with me. Uh, this thing about having standing on one foot and having the other foot at a straight point actually, like say your toenails are scraping across the floor with no pressure in it. I don't understand why you have two feet and you only use one of them at a time. You know, him upstairs, the greater person, designed you to have two feet for a reason. Use them like together, press, book pressure, pull and push. That's because I promise you, if you do that, you everything above it falls into place pretty much. It, everything works more naturally. You don't have to have a, an engine in your feet, an engine in your body, an engine in your chest, an engine in your arm, because it all comes from the same source. That makes life easier. So then you can enjoy the other stuff like music and feeling and passion. Uh, what do I want to see more of? Well, I can never have enough rhythm, so I guess it would be that. I mean, there's a good amount of it. That, that, that feeling of a body squeezing and sending a reaction and you see the music come in through the body and out through the body, I think that is just incredible. I mean, there can never be too much of that. Graham, what's the most extravagant thing in your wardrobe? Well, I bought this thing in Tesco the other day. <laughs> well, there are lots. Of, I mean, uh, there are lots of things in my wardrobe. I mean, far too many things. I mean, I. A uh, funny thing is, I I tend not to spend high money. I would I would buy something because I like it, and if I saw something I liked in Tesco's, I would buy it. Not, and I wouldn't not buy it because it came from Tesco's, and I wouldn't pay a ridiculous amount of money just because it's got Prada on it. Uh, I don't know, what is the most expensive thing I've got in my wardrobe? Probably my, two of my wrong gun suits that I had for Blackpool last year, probably. <laughs> um, if there's one thing you could change about yourself, what would it be? Ooh. Well, I'd like not to have lost my hair so early, although I'm, I, I've, got, I've got together with my gorgeousness now, but... Uh, what would I change about me? Oh, well, I'd like to have longer legs, damn it. I wanted, when I was competing, I wanted longer legs and a smaller bum. That was, that was my ambition. <laughs> and neither of which happened. It just got worse. Graham, uh, what are some of your hobbies and interests outside of dancing? Uh, I love going to the theatre. I mean, that's probably my, my main thing. I like spending time with my friends. So I'm... Uh, like I'm very close with David and Denise and Richard and Richard Rust and Pamela McGill. Uh, we spend time together, Christmases together with our families. Uh, I like spending time with that. I like I like going out. I like socialising. I was never I suppose when I was younger because I was always busy competing and running around everywhere. I, I kind of missed out the whole clubbing thing. I was I was never really into that. And in fact, uh, I remember Jeffrey Clinton. From, I think it was, I'm not sure whether Richard Porter came as well, because we're like same age group, same within three days of each other. We, I, I'm sure he came as well. Jeff took us to a nightclub, uh, a whole group of us, because it was our birthday. I think it was maybe our 18th. And we went to this nightclub and you know, the Hippodrome was an amazing place. And it, the, the whole ceiling used to lower and they had a laser show and everything. It was incredible. But, you know, I, I couldn't stand that thing. Like you had to stand with your, face in somebody's ear for them to hear you and then you have to turn the other way so they could speak back and the, the fact that my ears were ringing for three days later i hated it and that put me right off clubbing completely so i kind of didn't really do much of that i was only like i, I had to be the best dancer so that was i was involved with that so that was a bit of an odd thing i suppose um graham what's the best part about teaching for you oh seeing him i mean that kind of why i said really you can the level is irrelevant. The level is totally irrelevant. I mean, I, because I started, you know, from a strange position as a teacher, I, I taught in the studio that I belonged to as a, you know, as a class assistant. I did bits of teaching. Uh, my first uh, couple were a couple called Stan and Vi Hicks. I remember it so clearly. And uh, Tom and Queenie Shuttler, Mark Shuttler's parents. And, you know, and they were already quite old when they came to me for lessons. And, you know, but just to see it, they, they do something. And they would know it was 
slightly better than it was last week. And that would make them really happy. And that makes me happy. It's not about being outstanding. If you make some kind of improvement and you feel good about that improvement, I feel good about that. So I think that's probably the most important thing for me. So Graham, what's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? Oh, hit the alarm clock. Press news usually. Do you have any daily rituals? On a teaching day, my, normally, I, I, normally when I'm teaching, I start at 10. So I normally, my, I have a TV in my bedroom, as most people do, and I have an alarm on that. So the TV comes on at 7 o'clock uh, until 8.30. So somewhere in that range, I can get up, uh, yeah, shower, clean everything, uh, breakfast, a little bit of office work sometimes just to get something in and out. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I am not a morning person. That I can tell you. I am not. I can. If I've got to get up, it's not a problem. If I to get up at four to go to the airport in the morning, I can do it as long as nobody speaks to me, as my mum and my brother will doubt, undoubtedly testify. In the mornings, and my, I always remember this when I was a kid. So we'd come down for breakfast. I had cornflakes. My brother had rice krispies. We never crossed. <laughs> And my mum had always asked me questions and I would always shut up or not answer. And they were always telling me how miserable I was in the mornings. And it was true because I'm not a morning person at all. I hate it. Graham, can you tell us a secret about yourself that your mother still doesn't know? So she doesn't know. That's not much she doesn't know about me. I wonder, uh, what does it yeah, sometimes I, I used to go out late but never tell her. I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, nothing, nothing, no, nothing really. Nothing I could say on here anyway. Um, Patrick's asking, Patrick Helm, do you think that prices teachers charge these days makes dancing only for the wealthy? Yeah, that's a whole other subject there. I think it's unnecessary. I mean, everybody has to charge what they they've got to charge and uh, you know i'm comfortable with what i do and if they want to charge a lot more than that then that's, i'm also okay with it i think that upsets me a little bit sometimes is when the couple comes to you and complains about the one they've just paid the large amount of money to, and complains about their lesson so i think you know i said to him well, you do have a choice you didn't have to go did you i mean or you don't have to go so often so i think it's sad sometimes that the pre the life the lessons jump up in price so much and so often or we cut another five minutes off the lesson i mean i mean none of you would probably remember but when the lessons everybody taught an hour and then it went to 45 minutes and you know the, but the lesson price stayed the same and it was all those kind of things i mean the, those debates are going to go on for as long as we've all got a bum hole aren't they let's be honest it's going to go on on graham what's the best thing about england that I'm here. No, what's the best thing about English? I guess it, it's still, you know, from the dance perspective, you mean that, you know, we still have three of the best comps in the world and all those comps supporting it around, you know, Blackpool International UK. We're still very lucky that the world wants to come here and dance in those events because they see them as being fair, I guess, in you know, as fair as fair can be. It's the, it's the most likely chance you're going to get. Uh, so I'm I'm proud of that. I'm proud of, in general, what we do in this country for dancing. You know, things like I'm part of the BDF. I mean, the BDF do a lot of stuff for dancing. So I, I, yeah, I, lots of things, really. I think you know, we've produced a lot of great dancing. It's kind of where it all started. And then if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have all these amazing world champions spread around the world. Now. So, you know, and I think if anybody's been looking, if Doman Krapish has been, um, I mean, putting these videos up that he's been doing, obviously he's got a lot of time on his hands now, uh, of all past champions, I mean, way back. I mean, some of that is incredible to watch. I mean, he's doing such a great job. It's great to see that. Yeah. I know yeah. where you came from. Good job, Doman. So, Graham, my question I have is that um, you obviously are honorary secretary of the BDF. And you were the former vice chairman on the Latin faculty at the Imperial, right? 
Um, how important do you think it is for um, the young dancers, amateurs, professionals, whatnot, to actually be part of these organizations and actually take part? I think it's super important because, you know, again, the world has changed. It's a whole, it's a whole other world now. I mean, it would have been in the past when the top professionals retired. They, you know, people like Sonny Binnick would, would say to them, you will go to the Imperial and you went. You will dance the star ball and everybody went. Nobody would have not danced the star ball, you know, when it was a grown house. You know, if Sonny said, you go, you go. And then obviously that, that, that kind of power, whether that was good or bad, has gone. You know, nobody really carries that kind of weight anymore. And obviously there was a much smaller nucleus of people. Uh, so I think, you know, the, the whole world's changed, isn't it? I mean, it's difficult. Some of those questions are so difficult to answer because it's all such a different world now. And we have to adapt to it as it goes along. And some things are for the best and some things are possibly not. And I don't think everybody would necessarily have the same opinion on which are right and wrong, even. So, difficult. So, Graham, so we're going to take it up a gear. This is the last little section. This is the like quick fire, so you can give um, very brief answers. If there's a funny story or you want to elaborate on something, go ahead. I know I don't, I know I don't need to ask you that. What's that? This is not the sexual positions bit, is it? Yeah, well, that's, a, that's at the end. <laughs> Okay. Hopefully your mom's gone to bed by then. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, um, so what is the best thing about living in England? In general, I, I mean, I like um, the seasons, I think. I mean, I, I mean, we all complain about it. We all complain about the rain. We complain about the snow. We complain about the sun. We complain about the leaves falling. But I actually, I, I have tried living in slightly other places that I couldn't live. I, I'm really happy living in England. I like to know the seasons. I like when spring comes out of winter, then winter was worth it. What's the worst thing about living in England? Mm, the worst thing about living in England. Mm, that's difficult, actually. The taxes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the best thing about the USA? I think their dance setup in the USA is amazing, isn't it? I mean, that whole, I mean, you know, they were the pioneers of the whole pro-am situation and, you know, their whole business is based on that. And all of you people that, you know, are lucky enough to be able to go and make a career there because there's work that way. I mean, although that that is now kind of coming online in England too, uh, but obviously America set that up and you know they've had some amazing dances from America too but you know that platform of having work is probably really important isn't it and what, what's um what's the worst thing about the USA I think probably the same thing that some of the dancers they go to do that and then they get lost in the system so they then they stop they either dwindle it down so their so their presence in the international field becomes diminished and then they lose their mojo because their results is not so good because they haven't been practicing so much because they've you know been doing their pro students because that's what pays their bills I, I mean it's difficult i mean to find that kind of balance i mean it was kind of the same for me when i came back to compete when i had a full diary of lessons and then i had to work out how much of that i could still do and still compete so I had to reduce my teaching time down because there's no way I could have done a full day and practiced and had lessons myself. So you have to balance it. So again, I suppose that comes back to the passion for your dancing. I mean, does is your passion for your dancing your own dancing and your own career or just being involved in a dance industry? So yeah, so both, I suppose. What's your favorite travel destination? Mm. I, well, actually, I, mm, difficult. Italy. I'm going to say Italy. Yeah. I, for all kinds of reasons. Really. I love the the weather. You know, the 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 warmness. I love the 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 look of the people, the food, the wine. There's a whole whole package. I mean, the the you know, let's do it tomorrow. Thing is a bit irritating sometimes. But uh, I also like going to America. Japan, they treat you like royalty. I mean, I mean, there are lots of things I like. I mean, Moscow, 
the dedication, the power of their, when they come in for a lesson, they, they're there to do it. I, I, thought it the, I thought you were going to say the Canary Islands. Oh, God, that we could open up a studio there. Wouldn't that be great? I could have more excuses to, like, you know, two hours teaching and eight hours by the pool. Yeah. So uh, give a, if you had to give travel advice for anybody going there, what would you tell them? To, to Grand Canaria? Yeah. Oh, I mean, Grand Canaria is a real, oh, I don't know how you call it, a real mix-up of everything. You know, you have the posh hotels, uh, the retreats, the rough places. You know, there's this, in the middle of Grand Canaria, there's this Yumbo Centre, which is, I don't know how you describe it, really. I mean, if you've been there, you, I mean, you'd know what I'd mean. But, you know, I mean, everything is okay there, basically. I mean, you can have everything in there. I mean, it's, but it's just a great atmosphere. It's just it's great. And the weather is about as, the best kind of weather you can get this close to England. So, you know, therefore, the shortest flight. That, that's how it all started for me. It was the shortest flight for the most guaranteed weather. What's on your travel bucket list? Well, at the moment, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I'm just getting refunds from British Airways, basically. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had quite a lot of trips coming as i said before i mean i quite like traveling so I, sometimes of course you know you plan so far in advance to do something which seems like a good idea at the time uh, and then when you get there you think oh, i wish i hadn't done that or i've done it too close without a break and then then you get tired and that's when the depression thing sets in sometimes but yeah i mean yeah i mean who knows when we're going to be out of this and traveling again but yeah i won't be sorry that's for sure so, Graham, I want you to say the most British thing you can think of in a British accent. It's been a pleasure meeting you all. Can you, and the most American thing you can say in an American accent? Have a nice day. <laughs> and the most, standard, isn't it? the most Russian thing you can say in a Russian accent? Oh, my God. Now, I've got to be careful here, haven't I? No, I'm not going to do that. I was... Actually, that, that is a funny story, which I'm going to quickly say. But I, when I first went to Moscow, well, one of the early times when I was going to Moscow, I used to teach in a club called Crystal, uh, which is Anastasia Titkova's studio. And there used to be a couple called Alex Blahotnikov and Nastya. And he always used to have the first lesson in the morning. So he always used to pick me up from the hotel to take me to the studio. And every day, I'm nearly every day I was there, he would teach me some word. And as you can imagine, like everywhere you go in the world, the first words they teach you are always the bad ones. So every day he used to teach me a word. And he would say to me, but please don't tell Nastia. And every day when Nastia came into the studio, I'd ask her, Nastia, what does this mean? And she'd go, oh my God, who told you that? And I just pointed at Alex. And, and he would always be like, you bastard, you did it again. I said, well, you do it every day. I mean, I'm sure you must have learned man. And that went on for about four years. But yeah, no, no, I'm not doing it anymore, actually. What is a talent that you wish that you had? To keep my mouth shut. <laughs> to think longer and keep my gob shut. What's your favorite band of all time? Wow, band of all time. Mm, difficult. I guess like people like Edmundo Ross. I mean, I mean we got. I mean, you've got the great ones now. You like Ashley Froelich and uh, Joe Petty and those people. I mean, there's some there's some great dance people around now. I mean, Glenn Miller, I suppose, is probably going to be the greatest remembered orchestra, isn't he? I suppose. I mean, there's some great stuff that we still use today. So, must have been pretty good. What are your impressions on ballroom as opposed to Latin, ballroom versus Latin? What are your thoughts on the difference? I, I think that the ballroom has also kind of entered a new phase a little bit. Uh, in the sense that they've become a little bit more free. And I think, actually the same as I said about the Latin really, that if you look at the people in the final and coming behind the final you got you know younger couples that come in that bring something new to the table which like always people complain about you know it's it shouldn't be happening and they, i mean i mean if i think about the ballroom i always remember you know 
people were talking about Chris and Hazel, you know, how much they moved so fast around the floor and da, 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 and, and then they became three times world champions. You know, it was, there's always that thing. Michael and Joanne, it's not Latin. Yeah, but they still won black for eight times, so it must have been all right. Uh, you know, it's, I think the ballroom is, is entering a phase, you know, and I, it's the same thing if, it, if you, if you have, if you go around the politics thing too much and you don't find a path for your own dancing. I mean, I think about people like William Pino, uh, uh, Massimo, you know, those people that if I always say to my couple, I would rather be a remembered dancer than an, un, an than a forgotten champion. Right, something that remembers you, right? Be remembered for being something special. Right? Have to, that you've put something into the that wasn't there before, or you've done it in a way that's different to what everybody else has done. Because people will always complain about that. You know, like you know, you go back into you know, when the first mini skirt came on the you know, on the streets, they were disgusting and they were hookers and they were everything. And six months later everybody was wearing one, you know. Well not everyone, but the girls. Mm -hmm. And probably some of the boys do, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's like anything new is always treated as scary, isn't it? So I think I, I think it's always important that you bring you. To, you know, our job is to bring out the best of you, to bring you to the floor. Not, I don't want you looking like a Gray Moswick copy. How awful would that be? But what are your thoughts or impressions on rhythm and smooth in the states? I love it. I love, I think smooth is incredible now. I mean, that's that's beautiful to watch. I mean, obviously people that see it now, Blackpool get the chance that don't go to America. I mean, they've really taken that on a whole other level. I have to say, I don't really like the rhythm that much because I remember it how it used to be. When I, when I first went to America, when I was competing, the old style USBC. I mean, some of those rhythm dancers, I mean, they were rhythm dancers. And the, and the problem often now is that the rhythm dancers, well, obviously, a lot of American dancers have come from the Eastern um, Ukraine and Russia, etc. So they bring their style. So they, they, rather than being rhythm dancers they're doing rhythm with a latin start latin american british I want to call it style and i think well, and i was there recently I, I was in general a little bit disappointed i mean there are some amazing dancers in there but yeah it's like i mean i would really like to see them get like the mambo that i remember seeing and their bolero it's, it's something quite beautiful when they do it but if it's done by somebody on a straight leg it doesn't look quite the same Graham, what's something you still have with you from your childhood? No, I got rid of my teddy bear. Uh, what I still got with me from my childhood? I still got my big ass. <laughs> that's all. That's always right behind me. Um, Graham, can you do an impression for us? Anything? <laughs> what you mean, anybody? Yeah, or anything. Can I do an impression? Well, you see, you should have given me a briefing for this. I could have... Let me think about that one. Okay, we'll come back at the end, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm out of stall on that one. Better. What's your favourite colour? Purple. Least favourite? White. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Absolutely. I don't drink How, how do you take coffee. it? Huh? Well, I used. To, well, I've had all kinds of things. Uh, if I have, if I make it black with one sugar, if I go to Starbucks or Nero's, then I have a soya latte with like syrup in it. All the things that I really make you fat, and but I love it. <laughs> Graham, who's your role model in life? Wow. I guess your role model always starts out as being your family, doesn't it? Your your parents, they, they start, and your, you know, then Jeff, and then Mick and Lorna and Hazel, like those people, and the, the champions that go before you, and the way they, the way they behave. You, I think that's a big thing, you know. Like, I was always aware of what was going on around me, how certain people did certain things, 
you know, and I think that's important. It's, it's a bit like the listening to the music, isn't it? Don't go through things without seeing what's going on around you about how, you know, the respect thing has not gone out of the business, but I mean, it's not as good as it could be, you know, like the way turning up to a competition, looking like you're something and, I don't mean when you're dancing, but you, know, you go to the wash it and they turn up in jeans. I don't get that. It, that's no respect to an event. Like, turn up looking smart, looking nice, respect. You don't have to be in an Armani suit, but look nice. So I think that whole, the respect thing, watch what's going on around you. Learn learn what the, learn who are the good people, the ones you should watch. When I can think about people I looked at and thought, I mean, I, for example, Keith and Christine Burton, I mean, you know, was a professional, you know, I'm very close to David and Denise, you know, and they were always called the professionals professional, you know, because they just do the right thing. I wouldn't say that I always do that, but I try. Graham, um, if there was a trend, if you look back in a hundred years time and there's a current trend that, that that's happening right now, um, and you had the chance to eradicate it or take it away, what would it be? The point of scraping the toenails across the floor without and standing on one leg. Got to go. Graham, what's your spirit? Never arrived, but it's got to go. What's your spirit oh, animal? Oh, I've got one other thing I'm going to say because I've got a forum. Tell us. Tell us. If you're going to do, like, I mean, as everybody's resorting to online teaching and everything now. Before you go online and you teach, please have a quick look at the technique book before you teach the footwork of a step which is wrong. <laughs> it's not that difficult. It's Who did that? Your learning. Huh? Who did that? I can't tell you. It's not an it's not an isolated incident. Let's put it that way. It's not that if you're going to go on the and you teach it, it doesn't matter who you're teaching it to. That like you know the second the last step of. It's not difficult. Um, I feel better now. I've got that off my chest. Graham, what's your spirit animal? My what? Spirit I... animal. Oh, damn. I love tigers. I absolutely love tigers. And when I went to Thailand, oh, I've been to Thailand many times and been to several tiger parks. And I know they're not, it's not the best thing as far as animals can say, but being, to be actually able to be up close to a tiger, oof. I think they're just amazing majestic animals i love them if you had a different career path what would you choose or have chosen uh theater i would have gone into musical theater sure what's your favorite app at the moment solitaire city what's your favorite website at the moment oh i'm not really a computer person the Born Dancers Federation, obviously. Uh, are you hooked on any TV shows at the moment? I, I mean, this is really sad, but I love Judge Judy. <laughs> oh my God, I can't, I can never get enough of her. I just love Judge Judy. Um, I have two, no, two ears and one mouth for a reason. Yeah, that's my impression of her, I've covered them both now. Um, uh, if, yeah. you had one, if you had one superpower, what would it be? If I had one? Superpower. Oh, superpower. Oh, yeah. I wish I could transport myself, like, by clicking my fingers and be in New York or Tokyo, and you didn't have to go all through that bloody security shit at the airport. That would be fabulous. Graham, what's one of the hardest things you've ever had to do in your life? Ooh. Ooh. One of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Grow up. <laughs> I think that's pretty true. I think. I think that's true for a lot of people. You know, you always want to live that uh, Peter Pan thing, and then suddenly you get a mortgage and everything changes. <laughs> and so you have to be responsible about what you're spending and knowing you've got enough at the end of the month. And I think, you know, that's the problem. We all know how that feels as a competitor. I mean, it comes in one hand, it goes straight out the other to an airfare or a dress or a lesson or something. So, yeah, I think growing up's hard. What's your favorite swear word? Mm, there are so many. <laughs> I don't know. I guess, you know, you want to say the F word. When, when I'm really mad, I want an F. <laughs> Graham, if your life had a song title, what would it be? 
A strong title. Yeah, if your life was a song, what would the song title be? Get out there and do it. Um, what is your best feature? Well, I think it's probably my bum now. <laughs> I see. I grew, past, I grew past all of that and moved on to you know encompassing it with me. I don't know my strongest feature. I guess I like to make people feel good. I think, I think I'm not, mm. <laughs> I'm going to wait for the comments to come up now, but I think I'm quite good at that when, in the right time. <laughs> if you had to have coffee with a historical figure, who would it be? Wow. God, there's so many, aren't there? I mean, I would like, I mean, I, I suppose this is me because I'm a bit sad again, but I, mean, I would like to go back in, speak to all those champions i mean you know i have to say that what you're doing this kind of thing in this period because you know all right we're not all doing the thing that we would love to be doing which is dancing but you know this is just a perfect opportunity isn't it to to do the things that you wouldn't normally give the time to like finding out about those people that stand around the edge of a floor looking as miserable as sin uh, and like you know and using that famous adage like she hates me and she doesn't hate you she doesn't know you she just doesn't like your dancing there's a difference i mean i mean because we've all said that haven't we? he doesn't mind me. he hates me he's never met me but he hates me uh, yeah i think you know that if you had to have dinner with the current celebrity who would you choose <laughs> celebrity well, you're doing all the interviews now. I guess it'll be you now. Um, <laughs> celebrity. Just Judy. What's your favourite food? Lemon, pepper, and chicken. I told you before. All time favourite. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I'm I'm not. I really like food, but I'm not a foodie in that way. I mean, I like Italian food generally, but you know, I'm I'm gluten intolerant and lactose intolerant, so that's that that's been a, a recent like five or six years, so that causes a bit of complication. So that reduces my uh, choices somewhat, although obviously it gets easier as the years go on and there are more things out there. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, that whole thing of the the Italian food and the fresh white bread in the balsamic vinegar and oil and salt and pepper. I mean, I used to love that. What's, what's your least favorite food? Oh, I can always, you know, I'm funny. I went back to my childhood and I always remember watching my brother eat porridge and it's, and I still see it today. I still feel the same way about it. It makes me want to heave. So Graham, if we had to go out for dinner to a really nice restaurant, where are we going? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, what's the name of that? What's the one where they do the they fry the stuff in they cook the stuff on the plate in front of you? The Japanese, yeah. The um, um, hibachi, isn't it? No, they do, and the, the chefs they're all like, like they get specially trained to cook things and they do tricks with the eggs. And oh, I can't remember the name of it now, it's gonna really annoy me. Is there one in London? I mean, that. Yeah, they're everywhere, they're all over the world. I'm sure somebody knows that watching, they can tell us. Uh, what's your favorite song of all time? Favorite film? Song, song, my song. Brother's... Oh, song, sorry. Oh my God. Jesus Christ, where do you come up with these questions? Uh, I'm, I mean, I like ballads, so mm, I'm a, there I was always a Benny Hanna, yeah, Benny Hanna. Benny Hanna, there you go. Lauren got it. Thanks, Lauren. It's just, I mean, because again, I like food, but it's like the, it's the experience of it with the chefs cooking in front of you and they're doing all these ridiculous tricks with eggs and setting fire to the onions. And it's a, it's a great experience if you haven't done it. Uh, greatest song. I mean, ballads. I mean, I've always been a Shirley Bassey fan, not Shirley Ballas. I'm a Ballas fan too, but uh, Shirley Bassey. So, I mean, those big belting anthems that she always did i think yeah any of those um what's your favorite thing to cook lemon pepper chicken from waitrose right well i don't cook that i just uncover it and stick it in the oven but yeah i've got good at stir fries recently i've, I've been very inventive with stir fries i quite like doing that what's your favorite drink graham 
Actually, that varies for me. I'm, I'm because I don't really drink that much. It, I mean, it would never occur to me to drink at home, for example. I mean, I look, I can prove it. Look, I'm drinking water here. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, the gin tonic. Uh, yeah, I go through phases. I mean, I like gin and tonic. I used to drink vodka and coke. I like Baileys and chocolate Baileys on ice cream is the best. Uh, what's your guilty pleasure in life? Chocolate babies on ice cream. <laughs> My guilty pleasure. Well, yeah. Ch <laughs> vanilla ice cream, chocolate babies, chocolate raisins, lactose free, of course, and watching Judge Judy at the same time. I mean, I like it. <laughs> what do you love on your pizza? Actually, very controversially, I love pineapple. Uh, if we had a cocktail named in your honour, what would it be called? Well, I guess the Oswicologist, I suppose. And what's inside it? Mm. Actually, it's, it's funny, it's interesting because I went to a, when I was last time in Hong Kong, I was taken to a bar. And this bar is famous. They come to you and they interview you and they ask you what kind of drinks you like. And then they go away and make you a cocktail with something. So you have to tell them whether it's sweet, whether you like sweet, whether you like sour, whether you like creamy, whether you like... And it was, yeah, that was interesting. But I, I guess I like, I like things that are kind of a little bit sour, although I've got a really sweet tooth in that kind of thing. I like things that are a bit sour. So I probably have gin or something in it, and lemon and something like that in it. What's the most exciting thing that's ever happened to you in your life? Oh, most exciting. Oh, I guess, I guess when I got my first invitation to judge the British, I had, yeah, I cried. Nice. It was like, because, yeah, I mean, that was just, I mean, from, you know, going back what we said before about my, my heritage and my history, I wasn't a former champion and, like that they were going to trust me with the best comp in the world to judge it with, you know, with 10 other people was, yeah, that was unbelievable. Graham, when you, when you finally did start judging after retiring and whatnot, what, really, what were you most shocked to learn? How bloody difficult it is. <laughs> oh my God. If anybody really thinks that that is something you want to look forward to, I can't, I mean, I can honestly say, I hope Michael Williams is not watching this, but I can, I mean, I can only say I don't enjoy judging. I think it's something that senior people in the profession should do because they're the ones with the knowledge and experience to be able to do it. And you need to do it, I don't say regularly, but reasonably regularly because you need to train your eye. When you first do it, my very first judging event was for Len Goodman. And he used, he used to have a massive disco school massive i mean it was huge and i went to this competition in gravesend i think having never judged an event not really knowing what to do at all nobody had really told me and i got there and the first event i had to recall 70 couples in, i don't know i'm in pizza and the place was even and i i and the music was not like a boring competition where it was like a, a certain amount of time i mean the music was on and off and i think i put two numbers down <laughs> Scary thing I've ever done in my life. Um, Graham, Graham, what's the best way for you to wind and decompress? Who said that again? The best way that you like to unwind and decompress. Come home, shut the front door. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do like my own company. I'm a bit of a miserable git, really, in some ways. <laughs> I do like my own company. I, I, I like time for me. And, and obviously because I'm single and uh, I do spend a lot of time on my own, obviously because I live alone, uh, you get used to that. And like sometimes it's quite difficult when you're away somewhere and you're with people all the time. As much as it's fantastic, sometimes I find that like gets me a bit nervy because I, I need that time to just unwind. So I've, I'm okay then. I just channel things through my mind and I think about things and yeah, you know, just, just sit down and relax. I do like sitting down and relaxing. I do like that. Okay, so you have to choose uh, window or aisle? Oh, aisle. Every time. I can't bear being by window. Coffee or wine? Coffee. Beach or mountains? 
Big. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. Suit or shorts? Suit. Strong lip or strong eye? Strong eye. Eyes are important. Uh, teaching or judging? Teaching. That's easy. Uh, tell me three things you can't live without. Teaching? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I, I mean, as much as we all complain about our jobs at some point, thing, I mean, I can't imagine doing anything else. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Uh, chocolate. Uh, yeah, traveling, I suppose. As much as, again, I, I complain about it from time, I love it. I, I, mean, I like the whole experience. Do you have any pets? No, I, I mean, if I, I would love to have a dog. I mean, I would, I would have a golden retriever tomorrow. But obviously, I live alone and, you know, it'd be dead, wouldn't it? So you know, I would love to have a dog. Have you ever been arrested or put in jail? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> what's, your what's your definition of misery? I think it's called the coronavirus. <laughs> you have any dreams you still yet uh, have, uh, want to accomplish? <laughs> I think in terms of the, in the dance bit, I think I've done everything that you aspire to do other than sort of obviously being a, a, the champion. Uh, I've done all that, the other stuff, uh, but still keeping on with the teaching and still, because every time you get a breakthrough with somebody or a person or a couple or something, I mean, I'm always aspiring to do that and to repeat that experience. I guess if I wanted to do one thing, I would love to sing on a West End stage. Nice. Uh, describe your idea of the perfect weekend. Mm. Mm. God, that's hard. Uh, well, like, part of it would definitely be, I mean, I love London. I mean, I love going into London. I'm, I say every year I'd love to spend more time in London, especially in the summer, which is clearly not going to happen this year. But uh, you know, just being around the buzz of London is incredible. So to go up to London, go and see something, walk around a lot, go for dinner and go to a show, that would that would be encompassed. Or going to the beach in Brighton on Sunday, the day after. Matt, Graham, what's the most dangerous thing you've ever done in your life? Oh, my God. Judge Blackpool. <laughs> uh, yeah. I didn't get any threatening letters afterwards, so it was all right. Uh, dangerous thing see i'm not i suppose that is something i'm not a i'm not a big risk taker i have fantasies about jumping out of an airplane bungee jumping i mean i have all these things that i think i would do but yeah i don't know if i'd actually have the balls to do it when it came to it so i guess going on the big dipper in blackpool is probably one of them <laughs> if you if you, could, if you could choose and live somebody else's life whose would it be Nobody's. I'm quite happy with mine. Have you ever had a near-death experience? No, and I'm sure many people will be disappointed to hear that. <laughs> what is your biggest fear in life? Oh, I guess, yeah, rejection. What's the best advice you've ever received? Yeah, yeah, I've got to go back to Bill Irving then, don't I? You can't regret what you've done, only what you haven't done. Um, what's been your biggest lesson or um, learning experience in life? <sighs> biggest learning experience. I still want to say what would be the biggest, because that kind of implies it's one thing, but... Uh, I think, I think as you get older, you're aware of 
that your life changes. So, uh, in the sense that uh, you know, I'm still, I, I still consider myself, anyway, pretty mobile. Everything, you know, when you you see uh, people passing away and things and like, and you're getting closer to that. And I think that that teaches you that you have to live your life now. You know, there is no rehearsal. This is it. So if you're going to do it, do it now. Don't wait for you know a rainy day, as they say. Get out and do something. If you want to do it, go and do it now. Because the you know we've got no guarantee that there is a tomorrow, have we? So particularly at the moment. So we're almost done, Graham. We're almost done. What's the weirdest thing about you? The weirdest thing about me. Well, I'm just perfect. I don't know. It's like, that's weird because nobody else has that. <laughs> if you had to win ten million pounds tomorrow in the lottery, what would you do with it? Oh uh, well, yeah. I mean, I pay on my mortgage. That would be the first thing to go. Uh, yeah. I would, I know nobody's going to believe this, but I would do exactly what I'm doing now. I would obviously do less of it, probably. But I certainly, I mean, I, I know we had a conversation years ago with people when the lottery first started and people were saying, oh, well, I stopped teaching. Well, I, that says, well, tells me a lot about what you're thinking about teaching is there, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, I, I could never not teach. I mean, I would obviously, my family, obviously would all, be accounted for when they uh and i'd probably well not probably i'd definitely put money into dancing and somehow i know i don't know how that and what form but yeah but yeah funda fundamentally i guess i wouldn't really want to change anything it would just be much easier to to have exactly what i wanted exactly when i wanted it i suppose so, so great I'm one more question. So Graham, obviously um, uh, right now there's a bit of a mess in the dance world and everything seems to be divided. If you were in charge, what would you do to make it right? Or how would you fix the situation? You know, the only way of bringing people together is to talk, isn't it? I mean, that, that's the only, that is the only way forward. And I'm not, I'm not sure that we haven't gone too far in opposite directions now to bring it back. There was there was a time, I don't know. But I mean, if it were ever to happen, then it's gotta be done, it can't be done by dictatorship from either side, you know, because on our side, we have all the superstar champions, uh, you know, and the history, the other side has I don't know, the business brains, I suppose you could say, you know, because a lot of people that stand at the top of their chain, food chain, are, you know, people that were high up in business. So they, they, they're they much better at promoting their stuff than we are. I mean, if you go onto YouTube and you type in dancing, the first thing you're going to come up with there is their videos, their world champions. Uh, so, I, yeah, I mean, if you're going to ever bring them together, you know, you can only ever do anything by talking, can't you? That's the only way. So, Graham, what is your biggest inspiration in life? My biggest inspiration in life? Music and dancing. If you had a genie, you rubbed that bottle and your genie came out and gave you three wishes right now, what would they be? Well, like that this coronavirus isn't here and it's not happening and we're back to normal. That would uh, one for sure. Two, that I could have another two inches on my legs. <laughs> Only two. <laughs> yeah, I mean, otherwise I'd look out of proportion. But yeah, I mean, two inches of legs and maybe two inches. No. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was going to say, get my hair back, but no, that, was, that would be too much hard work. Uh, yeah, I mean, for everybody to be happy, but um, that would be bullshit because then you'd never appreciate the bad, the good times, would you? So, can't be gay, can't be good all the time, can it? So, Graham, uh, just the last three questions. What advice would you give your thirteen-year-old self if you had to go back in time? 
I'm not there yet. Um, if your 13 year old self, so have yet to go back in, in time. Yeah, I would say be aware, like see what's going on around you, like understand that there's something good in everything, everywhere. You just have to find it. On the flip side, if you had to go to yourself in, let's say, 20 or 30 years time in the future, what would you right now be telling your older self? Oh, my God. I hope you had a good time. <laughs> I, I hope you've got no regrets. <laughs> I think, Graham, how, how are you really feeling these days? How on? Say How are you really feeling these days? How am I feeling? Yeah. Good. I mean, you know, I mean, current situation aside, yeah, I'm happy with the direction my life takes. I'm not happy every day, but then I can't imagine anybody else is either. Uh, I can't say that I, I, I don't regret anything, particularly minor things, but yeah, I'm happy to be involved in the dance business most of the time. The dance business, not necessarily everything that goes on around it, but the dance business. Okay, Graham. Um, these are one word. This is, this is a one word answer required, and you can say whatever you whatever you feel or whatever strikes you. So, um, yeah. Len Harmon, genius. Denise Weavers, um, genuine. David Sycamore. Oh my God! What was your word for David? Uh, professional. Pam McGill. No. <laughs> Kenny Well. Oh my God, Ken! What was it called, Kenny? Yes. Kenny. And he's close to nuts as well. Uh, President Marion. Oh my God. Oh my God, man. What was going on, man? Oh my God, that's difficult. Oh my God, these are too difficult now. Just one word. One word. Oh my God, I can't. I think I'm a word. I think I'm you know, combinations of words. I think I'm one word. Oh my God, that's difficult. Friend, uh, Shirley Ballas. Dancer. Lorraine. Icon. And then last of all, Graham Oliver. All of them. <laughs> all of them. Everything together. Uh, um, yeah. One word to me. In a nutshell, Graham. Uh, happy. Thought you were going to say perfect. <laughs> I didn't want to push myself out there. You know what I mean? Well, anyway, that's yeah. it for me. Thank you for um, uh, taking the time out of your day to uh, chat to all of us and uh, have a little talk with me. I know it's um, over the prescribed hour, but what can you do when you're having fun? You're having fun, you know. So, um, I yeah, because I've got the time now. Oh my God! But it went pretty quickly. It went, pretty, it went pretty quickly, right? Yeah, it did. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I just say to. To everybody that is listening, thank you so much for taking the trouble to come and listen for a bit, uh, learn a bit about me. Hope you're not too bored. Uh, and like, we are all going to get through this thing together. It's not going to end anytime soon, but we will get there and we'll be out there and dancing again. So keep going, keep practicing, deal with those things that you can practice now, which you wouldn't have given the time to when you were in the studio. There's lots of things you can do in a restricted space. So do that. Always, there's always something you can do. And yeah, Jake, thank you very much.
No, anytime. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy and important you are. So um, thanks for putting me in. Um, everything else, uh, this will be posted probably on your page and my page and possibly on YouTube. So anybody who missed the first half or anything or had to go, they can always rewind to the back and watch the whole thing. So uh, thanks again, guys. Um, on Thursday, Hans Gelke will be joining me for part two because we had a little technical difficulty on his side where it closed. So he'll join us for part two, so tune in for that. But um, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Nice to talk to you, dude. Thank you, guys. Bye. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.